greetings and welcome. My name is Jake Rayson. I am a forest gardener and forest garden designer. This is the Forest Garden Lockdown live stream uh, every Wednesday at 10 a.m. British Summer Time. Uh, so, yep, yeah, I'll just kind of talk about various aspects of forest gardening. Sometimes I'm outside. Most of the time I'm sat in front of a laptop going to a slideshow. Today I am talking about the forest garden planning process. Essentially, how to map out your forest garden vision, what you see in your mind's eye and how to actually get that into an action plan. So without further ado, I've got very little time to do this, so I am just going to get cracking on with it. Um, these slides are available um, online always at forestgarden.wales forward slash talks forward slash planning and this slideshow will always be there. And you can follow me on Twitter, Forest GDN Wales, and I'm on Facebook as well, though I don't use Facebook that much. Uh, so that's me. Today's workshop, four things. Forest garden definition, just a very quick definition of what a forest garden is because it informs the whole planning process. What is design? <laughs> Obviously a very quick look at what design is um, and how it relates to a plan. And But more importantly, why make a plan? Why bother making a plan in the first place? Spoiler, because it saves you a great deal of time later on. And finally, a checklist. I love a list. I really do love lists. And I've made a list just for you. It's a PDF, downloadable PDF. Uh, and you can download it and fill things in and check things off. It's fantastic. And finally, some design tips and tools and tools and tips. So, forest garden definition. Um, I like to describe a forest garden as a wildlife orchard underplanted with perennial vegetables and edible shrubs. But there's a more kind of general definition as well, which is uh, working with nature to grow edible crops whilst emulating the woodland edge and you're using perennials and ground cover so it's productive you're working with nature to grow productive crops to to, to actually grow stuff that you use uh, and it emulates woodland edge and this is really kind of applicable to uh, temperate climates so where you have tree cover um, and you're using perennials, mostly using perennials, and you're using a living ground cover. So that kind of covers it. This is like a slightly different definition to the one I normally use. But this, the important critical thing there is work with nature. And for me, this is all about sustainability, that you need to make any system of food production needs to be sustainable. Any f way of living needs to be sustainable. This means, I've seen some criticism on Twitter actually, somebody said, oh, sustainable is a dinosaur term because sustain, sustain what? Sustain the current thing. No, 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 not sustain our current system. It means the way that we live needs to be sustainable. Yeah, there's regenerative is, the, is another term which is in current common use at the moment as well, which is fine. And I think we need to concentrate on regenerating. We need to look at regenerating our, our land, but also sustainable can we keep on living like this the answer to that question at the moment is no because we have the climate emergency but um so this is what i think is so important about forest gardening is that it's sustainable and the whole process is about creating an ecosystem you're creating a self-supporting system uh, which is closed insofar as you don't have to import anything uh, you don't have to import any fertility or any, uh, uh, oh, you don't have to import pesticides or fungicides or herbicides because the system supports itself. So it's a closed system in that respect, but it's also, paradoxically, it's an open system as well because it is open to the landscape. You are actually integrating the garden into the wide landscape you are working with the na native with the natural native wildlife and that's a really really important part of it it's a closed system so far from a human perspective because you're not bringing anything in but it's open in a natural perspective because you're integrating it with a wider landscape um i must write that down and what is design so <clears throat> i used to be a web designer in a previous life 
And really, you know, it's called one of the one of the terms. Pixel pusher was one of the endearing terms for for, for designers uh, and crayons. Um, but really, design encompasses is more than just the visual. Really, really is. It's not about the decoration. It's it's not it's not decoration. It's the the whole system that you're looking at. And design is purposefully putting things in the right place. Yep. You're thinking about where you want things. What is the right place is a massive, massive question. What's the right place? And some things feel right. You kind of sit down in a seat and it feels right. Or you go into a garden and it feels right. Or you you use a pen and it feels right. Um, but I think we need to look at it in kind of broader terms than the kind of just a human-centric perspective, a human-centered design. Uh, because design is a process and design is amoral. Yeah, it's not um, the link there is to uh, an article about IBM. IBM created the cards, computer punch card systems for the Nazis in the 1930s uh, for their, uh, their the, 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 the concentration camps. And I kind of only found out about this recently. Absolutely appalling. An amazing system it's it's a fantastically well designed for its time system totally evil <laughs> um so design is amoral you do need to have a wider moral you need to have a kind of wider moral framework and for me that really is about that's about life that every any kind of moral framework needs to put life at the center life is the is the starting point does it enhance life is the kind of fundamental question so that's kind of wider context um and for forest gardens specifically, the wider context is, is it sustainable? So you can see how the design now links up with the idea of sustainable design, that you're creating something that can be perpetuated infinitely, ad infinitum, forever. Um, so, yeah, that's the kind of wider context that I want to think about. Now, with design there are so many variables there is not one size fits all and it's so important to realize that people will say what's the best design for my garden and it depends it depends upon so many variables oh did i write this down it depends upon so many variables um so there isn't like a one size fits all there isn't like um I mean, the National Forest Gardening Scheme are doing a fantastic. I think they're doing a fantastic job. I don't have, haven't had a huge, vast amounts to, to to do with them apart from the seminar that I did the other day, and they have a scheme called Forest Garden in a Box, uh, which is a whole lot. Uh, 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 it's an easy approach to you get a whole lot of plants in a box and then you post them out to people in different size boxes for different size bits of land, but it's actually quite. It's a really really tricky thing to do because. You there aren't the one plant doesn't fit in all different places. One plant in one place is be too big for another place, or the conditions won't be right, or you won't have enough time to look after it. So the variables, all the different variables, um, really determine the design. So this is why planning is so kind of important because there's so many variables. You want to get all the variables out. You want to to know what the variables are before you start the design process. So the, the planning part of it really is to say, what do I want? Uh, the design process is, is, well, where can I put it and how does it fit in? Um, so forest garden design, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. So forest garden design, slightly coming back, is about working, yeah, working with nature means designing for nature. So this is an integral part of the, uh, integral part of the kind of design process. Uh, oh, a forest garden plan, yeah. So this is an integral part of the design process is the natural side of it. Whatever your variables, whatever your situation, whatever plants you want, whatever features you want, this is at the center. This is like, how do I create an ecosystem in the space that I have and the time that I have and the, uh, the, 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 the resources that I have? How can I grow an ecosystem that best serves me as a human but also wildlife which also benefits me because then it'll be an ecosystem and then it will be, will be balanced yeah so that's at the this is at the heart of forest garden design um and, I, and as part of this it's native plants where possible because native plants support wildlife native wildlife because they have co-evolved together 
lots of work and literature on that out there, but it's the truth. <laughs> uh, so planning. <clears throat> so this is where the 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 planning comes is the whole process. The planning encompasses the the, the design. Uh, but you really want to start off with planning by writing lots of things down and getting it out there. A lot of people will have an idea in their mind about, oh, this is, um, I want a forest garden, fine, fine and great, and they've got a, a vague idea, which is good as well, uh, but you, it really helps to get these ideas out, even to, uh, particularly to discount them. Uh, you might say I'd like to grow a nut orchard, but you have a semi-detached house with a with a forty-foot back garden, in which case you can't really have a nut orchard. But it's good to get it out there and say what you want to be able to discount it. So it's about making, work, figuring out what you want and figuring out how you can, if you can have it and how it fits in. Yeah. Um, so a plan is really about. It's important to write it down because it's really about communication and it's if you're working for a client like I work for well not at the moment because I'm furloughed but I normally work with with clients designing forest gardens and the plan communicates uh, what you're doing to the client that's just, it's the way of letting them know I and mean, it's also a process it way the way for, to let you know how things are going what things can go where but if you're doing it, for, it's also really, really important to do it for yourself because you make a plan for your future self. The number of times that I have, <laughs> you know, I've gone and put something somewhere and I haven't put a label on it and I go, what is that tree? I have no idea and I've got to look it up and look through my notes. So if you've got a plan, just like a list, a piece of paper or uh, it's a list on a computer or whatever form, whatever form it takes, it's a way of getting that information, that vital information. Um, so number one, number one, make a list and then write everything down. Luckily for you, I have made a list for uh, breaking down the, the, the mega list, the plan into a load of different parts. <clears throat> and then what you want to do as part of the process is once you have everything written down, you go, you go through a pro you, you distill the ideas and you kind of discard things that aren't practicable. Uh, and you, then put them into the design, which is to say, these are the things that I want, and how do I, with a design process, you actually figure out how to put them where, where to put them in the garden. Yeah. So, um, let's get on to the planning checklist. Uh, this is actually, <clears throat> in some respects, this is a bit, yeah, you know, it's a bit dull because it's a big list, and it's a list of words. But in other respects, the forest garden. Uh, design process is really the, the planning and the design process is a really exciting part because this is where anything is possible this is where your crazy ideas about um, cascading waterfalls and um, uh, uh, the effect of a, of a rainforest in a in a suburban Surrey house uh, household garden so this is where the, the thinking comes through. This is where like the ideas come through. So it's actually really, really exciting. And it grounds you. The, 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 the writing the things down uh, grounds, grounds the kind of, um, the, it connects you with where you are. It connects your mind with the surroundings. So it's actually an exciting part, um, despite the amount of um, the lists and words and things. Um, so I've broken it down into a survey. Um, yeah, so survey is to look at your situation in the broadest general term look at you looking at your situation and making a note of it then it's the features what features um do you want what do you what do you want out of the out of the garden what do, would the wildlife want out of the garden as well uh making a list of plants one of my favorite bits and then uploading pictures uploading pictures or printing pictures out collecting pictures pictures are actually really really useful i mean i've got some oh, i don't know let's have a look i've got one here oh, ah. uh, can i see that and this is a picture we uh looked at this is in snail beach i think in um, shropshire and it's i think and it was like a this is uh, just a house we were looking at years and years and years ago and it's just really exciting because it's it's up on my wall. It's a little, it's a den, kind of wonky den. 
and I have it up there and I kind of look at it and go, oh yeah, I must, I must do that. That's, that's really good that, I like that. I must get some corrugated tin. So get pictures and put them on your wall and use uh, Pinterest and collect them and put them on, you know, use them, have them as inspiration. And finally, the map, uh, mapping all this out. Okay, uh, there is a downloadable checklist, so you can download it here. I'll put the, uh, this in the blog post that I do as well, so you can download the, P the PDF. Um, have I got it here? It's very, <laughs> very exciting. Look, it's a list. It's a list of stuff. Where is it? Mm, there we go. Um, four sides of A4. So let's quickly zoom through the survey. There, use the notes. When you, when you get the link to the slideshow, look at the notes, press P, and it will give you the notes for the different sections. Okay. Um, so you can get the, you can get the information out. So survey position, position of your land, elements, earth, the soil, the wind, the, 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 the water, the sun, Fe features, existing features that are already there, the situation, um, where you are in relation to neighbors and you, your personal situation, your family set up, your, you know, what, who else is in your family. So survey, um, position, sorry, yeah, position. So three things here, there's orientation, which is simply where the land is in relation to points of the compass. This is a really, really important. This is one of the most fundamental, most fundamentally important parts of the surveying and planning and designing process because it determines how much sun you have and how much sun you have determines which plants you have yeah so south facing sun's in the south <laughs> rises in the east sets in the west but this is really really important there's um yeah so orientation figure out where you where your land is in relation to points of the compass elevation how high up you are, you are that will determine uh the, the the kind of climate that you have as well and the slope how steep the land is the steeper the land the harder it is actually to work uh, we've got quite steep land here it is quite painful um elements okay oh good lord oh i've got messages through oh cool 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 sorry um 56 sorry i'm i'm, I'm having a bit of a uh, okay interlude here um video keeps freezing for 556 sorry about that i will yeah there's nothing it seems to be fine this end there's not a vast amount i can do i'll just keep on plowing ahead so elements um the <laughs> the elements are water where the water is on the land how much water there is in the soil where the water table is if you have any winter borns where you have streams that come up in the winter we've got one outside literally outside the back door uh where if they have any long-term year-round streams where yeah you know, where the water is on the land and the dampest patches of the land the soggy bits and the dry bits uh, because that determines what plants you can grow the earth the type of soil that you have there's two type well you need to know if there's enough nutrients in the soil and if you need to do any adjustments for that. So the nutrients would be um, uh, potassium, nitrogen and phosphorus. Are the kind of three three main ones with some trace elements as well. So get a soil test done. I have them done at Farmers Co-op, uh, local Farmers Co-op. And then you, that gives you an idea if you need to ad adjust the soil at all. At all. Um, acidity of the soil, the pH of the soil, because again that will determine how much, how many, what range of plants you can grow, um, and you can get a test for that. And there are things that you can do about that. I haven't got time to go into them today. Uh, the wind, which is the prevailing wind direction here, it is southwest. And I, I think most parts of the UK it's southwest, but I'm not sure about that. So do check where the wind comes from. That will determine which wind breaks you put in. Uh, the sun, there is a fantastic app called Sun Surveyor, um, sunsurveyor.com, and this tells you with the position of the sun in the sky, uh, and then you can use that to work out how much light a particular area gets throughout the day, but also through, across the year as well, and then you can work out if you have a, I don't know, a three meter high windbreak in a certain position, 
will the sun still get to that patch of land? And you can use your mobile phone with this app and say, oh, yeah, no, it's only going to get sun half the day, therefore I will plant such and such a plant. Yep. And then climate. Um, there is a, uh, with a website called Meteo. It's not actually in the notes. Uh, Meteo.com. You can get long-term climate for your particular place, your particular site. Um, yeah, it's kind of, you don't really want to, if you can, hold off from planting anything major and structural until you've done a plan and a design. And to be honest, this kind of takes, I, I kind of leave it like a year before getting into involved in any kind of serious planting because it's going to take that time to see what's going on around you. I mean, the temptation is to plant things straight away, but actually give it a little bit of, give it a little bit of time to, um, to settle in so you know where you're at. Okay, and should I do that in there? Oh, there we go, that's better. Okay, and then f features. Uh, what existing plants are there? Existing plants tell you a lot about what plants you can grow. Um, just trying to think of an example. Yeah, I like we have Creeping Buttercup. Um, I can't remember the name of it, Ranunculus. Nope, forgotten it. Uh, creeping Buttercup, big kind of thick white roots. It grows really, really well in um, here. It likes rich, damp soil. Um, and it like as I think part sh part shade it kind of I think it prefers part shade and it grows in exactly the same conditions as Nepalese raspberry because I've been pulling out loads of it a couple of days ago so um, yeah that creeping buttercup indicates that you can grow a lot of you know that you can grow Nepalese raspberry as a ground cover for example um, yep so look at the existing plants and existing trees as well ash trees for example are known for taking the moisture and nutrients out of the soil they're quite greedy trees and if you can have a greedy tree um so what's what's the setup of the plants that you have existing plants that you have and what effect are they having on the on the land as a whole utilities really really important water pipes sewage pipes overhead power lines telephone lines all those things it determines which trees you plant where. I think I've got, this reminds me actually, I've got a rowan tree growing directly beneath a uh, power line. I didn't realise and it's, um, I didn't realise it was a rowan tree. I don't know how it's got into the hedge. It's all supposed to be, it's supposed to be um, Gelder Rose. And uh, yeah, I've, I'm not sure if there's enough room for it to grow, keep on growing, whether I should take it out or not. So, yeah, existing plants, existing, uh, existing uh utilities and structures have a look at have a look at the what utilities are there make a note of them yep so make sure you don't plant anything underneath underneath the power line on top of a pipe uh structures what kind of buildings are there what like uh, foundations for for old greenhouses that kind of thing and make a note where they are um access public footpaths existing footpaths gates uh you know rights of way yep you need to make a note of that as well ordnance survey is a good place to go for this kind of information um if you go to bing.com forward slash maps they have actually have an ordnance survey map on there on the desktop version so that's a good place to go to to get um access information from and finally uh, oh, situation neighbors um we have a lot of uh it's a dairy farm area so we have a lot of cow poo liquefied cow poo um, otherwise known as slurry sprayed onto the fields and it's uh yuck yuck but there we go so privacy noise smell that kind of thing what are your neighbors doing and this cut again will affect what features you want and what kind of plants you want and what kind of shelter and protection you'd want from these things and finally you what your setup is with the household, how many people, um, how much, you know, what other people's needs are in the household, um, how much energy you have, how much knowledge you've got if you're starting out, if you're experiencing growing veg or, you know, just have a kind of summary of what you're, where you're at and what you want to get out of it. Um, how much time you have, this is kind of critical because forest gardens do take time. They do take time to, to, to plan and to design um, and they take plan to establish. I mean, you can do them quite quickly. But it costs a fair bit of money. Um, 
it does make me laugh. People will talk about having a kitchen done. I think, I don't know, so I'm not, really, not very good with kitchens, but I'm imagining it's something like £10,000 to have a kitchen put in, like a full fitted kitchen. And then that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of, for yeah, for a garden, that's kind of peanuts really. Um, I have got a, a blog post about estimates for the prices and it and it is kind of pricey if only people would invest as much in gardens as they do in their kitchens um so you yep that's a survey so write all this down uh get it down there now the features what what features do you want polytunnels greenhouses wildlife ponds wildflower meadows this kind of thing annual vegetable beds we've got annual vegetables here gradually transitioning to perennial vegetables but everything that you want put it in there write list write it in a list um and then always discard it however fanciful you can always not do it later whereas if you don't think of it now you'd be kicking yourself down the line if you if you don't have it and then plants my favorite bit um this is a picture of cardoon in the forest garden um plants for a future fantastic website i'm sure you know about it well fantastic website if you don't know about it do have a look uh list lots of use, useful plants RHS Plant Finder is at, is one of my favourite websites as well. Uh, it's kind of geared up for ornamentals, but is worth looking at for um, to, to to get the native filter. You can actually filter uh, kind of you can filter the plant results and just get natives back. So it's so useful for that. And uh, think native wildflowers. So if you're thinking of ornamentals. And you want to make it, you know, design a kind of ornamental garden, which you can, is perfectly capable with a forest garden. I mean, just look at, you know, look at that um, cardoon leaves. Absolutely stunning architectural plant. But also think about native wildflowers as well and integrating them. For example, we have some columbine and uh, red campion growing in clumps together a bit round by the wildlife pond. It looks beautiful. It looks lovely and totally accidental but fantastic and i just think well encourage it and keep on trying out different plants and we've got a huge range of wildflowers as well um pictures as i said before make a list of all the pictures put them on your wall pinterest is a good website to upload them to um and then finally the map um ah, now the map okay 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 right then so i'll just i've got another question in on the chat i'll just come to that in a second so i'm not it, it's kind of tricky to get to, to to balance all of the chat with the talk as well um i will just go through the map the whole there's a very famous quote the map is not the territory i think it was a polish designer in the 1920s i think 1930s can't remember the map is not the territory, but it is a close facsimile of the territory, so that it performs a function. Yeah, it does something. And the whole this is a this here is a uh, a map of the orna our ornamental forest garden, still in its very early stages. And the purpose of it is to mark important features. Um, so it can be paper, it can be a CAD plan, but it's. It doesn't matter but the what does matter is that you're marking the key features on it so you know where to put stuff and i was saying before about the survey which is why the survey is so important you can't skimp on the survey because you need to know where your power lines are um, and you need to know <laughs> where your access points are so you plant things and you put things in the right place so the important features are the kind of utilities and the like plus the the, the tree positions the, the can in the forest garden this is the canopy layer the big trees and you need to make sure that the trees are in the right place as well so that they're happy and that they there's an, they have enough space um there are some resources that you can use um if you are going to use a paper plan i would suggest using five mil square paper to draw the plan uh online there's one called scribble maps uh which is in the, this is in the notes as well and then for CAD, I use QCAD, which is brilliant, and there's LibreCAD, which is free software as well. So this is a whole other, creating a map is a whole other um, 
it's a whole other part of the uh, the it's a whole other lecture. I haven't got time to go into it now. I'm really sorry about that, but I will come come back to it and do some more on this. Okay, so back to the questions from Rob Downs on the chat. Ranunculus repens repens. I don't know how to pronounce the Latin. Um, uh, that's the creeping buttercup. And on the subject of windbreaks, uh, wants to pl plant a row of nurse trees. How far from the windbreak should I place it, please? Uh, the that's a funny one actually because the nurse trees are there. Normally, you plant a nurse tree. My kind of understanding of this is that you plant a nurse tree to protect specific other trees. So I have a nurse tree in front of. Um, Oh, I've got some old corners in front of a cherry tree in an exposed position, for example. So I tend, tend, I don't know what the purpose of the nurse tree would be. Would the nurse tree, the nurse tree won't really be to protect the windbreak because the windbreak should, you know, that's the whole point of the windbreak is it's a windbreak. So a nurse tree is like a temporary windbreak for specific plants. Um, if you're planting a nurse tree in front of a specific tree that you want to protect, it's about two, three meters. Uh, you do have to be aware that the, when the nurse tree gets to a certain size, like I use Scotch broom, and which grows to about three meters, and I've used cornice as well, that they will need to be moved at some point or, or chopped down because they will start to take light and food and uh, water from the tree that's supposed to be protecting. So I hope that's answered that question. Um, yep, yeah, do add it to the Zoom thing if you can get to the Zoom um, after this Zoom chat thing. Okay, where are we? Oh, tools, nearly there. So, 30 minutes design guide. Blimey, right then, design guide. Four things. This is just like a really, really quick overview of the 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 design process so you've got your your plan in place you've done your survey you've written down your list of features you've got your plants you've got lots and lots and lots of lists of things uh, and then you're looking at the actual map you've got your map kind of skated over creating the map but let's you've got a paper map or a digital map the kind of key thing really is to work from the house and the kitchen because this is where you're growing food for uh, and this is where the people are and then you design outwards from that so kind of a really good rule of thumb is to d design from the back door or from the kitchen window and 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 then work your way outwards and the 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 most used crops and the most used areas you put them nearest so you put like the greenhouse or the polytunnel nearer to the nearer to the house not the far end of the house depends on your setup obviously and depends where the light is um, and then you use the herbs, the herbs are nearest and the leaf plants, the leaf crops are nearest. So your spinach plants are kind of nearer because you're going to be using them more. But then your kind of fruits are a bit further away that don't need some, like apples don't need to be so close to the house because you don't have to go out and pick apples for a particular meal. You go out and pick apples all in one go. So the apple trees can be a bit further away. Yeah. So most used nearest, highest maintenance nearest as well. And then think of paths. And actually, as part of the process of designing um, different parts of the garden, the paths are really, really important. And I kind of never really, I didn't really figure this out until I'd done a couple of designs. And the paths help define the different areas. And the reason to divide up a garden to different areas is so that it makes it easier to think about each different area and how it what it's doing and how it how it fits in with the whole and the paths help define it so think about the paths and where the paths can go and what the what the what the garden's doing and what you'll find is as well this is like a this is a a, a, a sketch um print out of a plan i did uh, a while back for a client in poland you'll find that the the design <laughs> The kind of visual design will come. Uh, it, the, the, how a garden looks will kind of evolve, will grow from the kind of functional side. Uh, form follows function. So yeah, um, paths really, really important, um, and zoning and areas, uh, and it also makes it easier just in terms of it enables you to break things down and gives you the time to do it. So right plant, right place. 
yeah, put the right plant in the right place, it will be happy, it will grow. Plant for the final size. I kind of, um, this is such an important thing. It just comes time and time again, whatever, whether it's a tree or a shrub or a perennial vegetables, plant for the final size. Yep. When you put a plant in, give it enough room to grow to its final size. And that's the same for windbreaks, the same for the canopy layer. Um, you need to have the, and yeah, you need to make sure that it, it fills that space. If it's too big, you'll be spending forever cutting it back or it won't be happy and won't grow very well. Um, and make sure it has the right amount of sun. So full sun, partial shade, full shade, uh, the right type of soil, the kind of moisture level of the soil, the type of soil, uh, sandy or, 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 or clay or loam, whatever the, whatever the conditions. Be aware what the conditions the plant will like. Those resources I gave earlier on, Plants for a Future and RHS, Plant Finder, they will tell you the conditions that a particular plant likes and then you can match that with your plot. Um, and as part of the oh, part of the, the, right, the plant size, this is for the canopy layer, but it's all different plants. You've got to get the tree spacing right. You've got to get the, the, the plant size right for your, for your trees. Um, and this is like one of the commonest uh, mistakes but one of the commonest things people do they put the trees too close together because you get a little stick m big old space they go that never fill that so make sure you get the 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 tree spacing right the rule of thumb is a half a, a quarter to a half of the average canopy diameter so you've got two four meter diameter trees the space between them needs to be about one to two meters and that will allow enough light to come through for the crops beneath uh, and finally protection uh, my old dead edges <laughs> windbreaks is what ultimately what you want everywhere and then you want to have um, in the meantime plant nurseries as um, Rob said on the chat uh, you plant a nursery to protect a particular specimen this windbreak this uh, and the same goes for dead hedges so dead hedge is a collection of branches that you put in a pile that provides some protection and this particular dead hedge here is protecting uh, a bamboo which is getting a bit battered by the wind so useful tools um, the, the uh, yep yeah, just very quickly uh, two to three meter bit of bamboo easiest way of measuring if you're out so once you've done your plan you've got your design always 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 measure the land because the plan will always be out the design the map will always be out always measure the land yep yeah? and you use um for me the easiest way to measure the spacing between plants is to use a two three meter bit of bamboo with one meter intervals or half meter intervals marked on it and that way you can quickly calculate if a, a, a plant has enough space where you propose to put a plant if there's enough space for the plant next to it yeah, that's it's funny it's 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 way easier than a tape measure or a, a string and bamboo um, string and bamboo I do use it um, you can see here I don't know if you can see that there's a chalk circle around a bit of bamboo and that was made that chalk circle was made using a bamboo with with half meter intervals marked on it and then I work out the the, the the width of the tree and you can see the spacing between the between the different trees I've got here um, so two to three bit meter of bamboo marked string and bamboo um, bit of bamboo with string on it knots in it uh, and a measuring tape surveyor tape absolutely kind of yeah brilliant um, measure twice plant once yeah and you also you'll need clipboard and um, my favorite tools <laughs> gloves um secateurs decent pair of secateurs uh which you can see here and uh pruning saw hand saw um those are i always carry them around with me and they're useful whatever part of the design process you're doing whether you're clearing brambles or you're pruning fruit trees or what, what have you so i always carry them about and there we go forest garden takeaways Oh, I'm 10 minutes over. So write it all down. Make the big mistakes early on paper uh, rather than planting trees and moving them later and take your time. Um, so hope that's useful. Now um, I'm going to stop streaming and then I'm going to go over to the Zoom chat. So I'm, I'm kind of 10 minutes, 10 minutes over. Uh, hope that was useful. Um,
you can email me this email address hello at forestgarden.wales and you this you can sign up for my newsletter for more <laughs> fun and games forest garden fun and games